Good evening, everyone, from Chicago, Illinois. I'm Lucy Gray, the co-chair of the Global Education Conference, and I'm excited to welcome my friend Martin Levins here tonight to speak with you about his journeys in education. He is an Apple Distinguished Educator, and I'll let him tell you more about that um, in his work. I, I've known Martin since Mac World in like 2008. Um, I had the opportunity to meet him, and I see him just about every year at the ISTE conference. So um, I'm going to take us through the next couple slides, and then um, turn it over to you in a second, Martin. Uh, we want to thank all of our sponsors and supporters for uh, making this event possible. We hope that you will take advantage of some of the offerings of these organizations who are very forward-thinking and globally oriented. And um, once again, we're appreciative of their efforts. <clears throat> this is our favorite part. I'm going to turn on the whiteboard uh, permissions. And uh, we ask all of our participants to let us know where they are in the world. And the tool, if you don't know this by now, is to the left of the whiteboard. It's the one that looks like a star. And you double click on that and then double click on your location. Looks like somebody's near me. Um, it's probably the, another Illinois person. I'm in Chicago, outside Chicago, Illinois, in um, a town called Northbrook, where it is uh, 10 o'clock at night and a little chilly right now. Uh, if you also want to introduce yourself in, um, in the chat, uh, it would be great for Martin to know um, where you are. And let's see where we, where we, the diversity that we've got in today. It looks like we have a lot of North American and Australasia people here tonight. Uh, we've got Canada, California, New York City, Phoenix. Hopefully a few more people will join us in a little while. Um, so that takes us to the next slide. And I'm going to turn off the whiteboard permissions. And we have our slides here. Um, thank you, Martin, for being here. We're looking forward to hearing your thoughts. And uh, take it away. Thanks, heaps, Lucy. That's really good of you. Um, and welcome, everyone. Um, you, it's lovely to see people from uh, all over the world. Um, I'll notice that uh, we've got some Santa Rosa, Hobart, Lake County, which I'm guessing is just east of Vancouver where my son lives at the moment, uh, New York City, Anya Connie, and Lucy, of course, and Peggy. Greetings from Phoenix, and greetings to you. And that's about all that's commented on the, um, on the chat form. So uh, when Lucy asked me to do this, it uh, wasn't all that long ago, and I, I got to thinking about um, what it was that drives us and rather than talking about um, global education per se, rather than talking about technology per se, um, I'd look at what is meant by good education. And I must admit that I'm, I'm still um, struggling with this from time to time. I started teaching in 1972, I think it was, and I finished teaching in, 19, in 2015. Uh, I retired for a year um, and got bored, so I applied for another job. And I'm now working with um, eight other educators with 160 disadvantaged schools throughout um, Australia. And these schools are disadvantaged on the basis of um, socioeconomic status or indigenous population or rural remote status, and of course sometimes it's all three. So it's a very challenging but fascinating uh, thing to be involved in. We have a new um, curriculum in Australia called the Australian Curriculum. I spent ages working on that now. And uh, part of that is a thing called Digital Technologies Curriculum, which runs from year, from kindergarten to year eight in a mandatory uh, sense. Uh, so all teachers have to teach digital technologies from kindergarten through to year eight. And uh, then the kids can specialize and uh, it's optional from nine through 12. 
it's a very challenging um, thing to do to write a curriculum um, which will stand the test of time and it has been written I think in a really good way if you uh, just Google digital technologies curriculum Australia it'll take you to the web page where all of that is discussed and the fact that various government authorities take so long to implement things because they all want to put their own little stamp on it means that the curriculum will be almost 20 years old before the first student goes through the total um, the total run. There's 12 years of students going from kindergarten or 13 years of students through to their finishing year and there are about eight years in development, approval and then adoption by the various states. So I live in New South Wales which is on the east coast of Australia. I live at 1000 metres in a place called the New England, about halfway between Sydney and Brisbane. Um, in my first year of retirement I spent a lot of time uh, working as president of the Australian Council for Computers and Education which is a bit like ISTE but uh, not quite as large <laughs> and um, now working full time with the Australian Curriculum Assessment and Reporting Authority. So this question has been on my mind for a long time. I've taught a lot of subjects to a lot of years so I've taught from year three through to uh, tertiary. I'm a casual lecturer at our local university in the School of Education and uh, I've taught sciences, mathematics, geography, English, uh, technological and applied studies, computer studies, design and technology and I used to also run an outdoor education program for 20 years for 16 year old boys. So with no further ado let's move on and see if I can drive this thing. My basic premise is that um, any um, education that's worth its while should be able to change but should also be able to stay the same. And this has been a guiding principle for me uh, and that is that if I consider what are the important factors in an education then they become pretty much immutable and shouldn't change, they should stay the same. But to do that we have to change and that might seem counterintuitive but my values in education you'll see coming up on some slides in a minute and I intend not to go for the whole time, I want to just have a bit of a look at uh, some ideas and then toss it over to a, a general Q&A session. Um, I want you to have a look at a few examples of kids work uh, that I've done and uh, things that have impressed me. So changing and staying the same means that for argument's sake we want a student who has good collaborative skills. I think we've always wanted that. We've always wanted students who can work, play well with others and work well with others. But that means different things nowadays than it did say 50 years ago. So unless you change, unless you invoke uh, a global um, collaborative exchange between students, unless you adopt a digital approach to this then you are not going to be able to achieve your core value of students becoming contributory uh, citizens who can work well together. So that's my premise if you like. Some of the things that have influenced me uh, I, I want to go through now. So if you look at the word curriculum which is what most schools are based around, you know, this is what we teach you can have a look there at a definition and, and basically it comes from running a course. In fact curriculum uh, or a derivation of curriculum was uh, the name that was given in ancient times, in Roman times when Latin was spoken to a race course and if we think about it a lot of our schooling is like that people talk about uh, a circular curriculum or a spiral curriculum, one that keeps coming back on itself and builds and builds and builds but it's a little bit like a race and nowadays with high stakes testing it's even more so. Now I don't particularly like um, 
using that word, there's a friend of mine in the United States who says that the best thing we could do with curriculum is to get rid of half of it, and he doesn't really care which half. And I tend to agree, and hopefully I'll convince you over the period of this uh, little chat. So one of the things which we don't do in education is to give teachers much in the way of autonomy. And that's quite different to other uh, countries, uh, or to some countries I should say, which people hold up as being the success um, in education terms. So you've got a little bit of business there and uh, this recording will be made available to you later so you can grab a hold of that uh, some stage later if you've missed out on it, but I think you get the gist in that amount of time. So the thing that everyone holds up as being important is Finland. And uh, Pasi Salberg, who is the former Director General there, makes this statement on, interestingly, Diane Ravitch's site, and some of you will know who she is in the United States, um, former um, uh, person who was an advisor um, and controller of education in the United States, certainly changed her view on uh, how education was running. And I read this on her um, blog uh, site, where the, the state, or the country in this instance, Finland, devolved the responsibility of what should be taught in schools to the local uh, government area. But the local government said, well, the people who know best about education are the teachers. So they devolved it to the teachers. So if you have a look at this, you'll see that setting a standard um, and what it is that's actually being taught is decided essentially by the teachers in each school so they can customise what they've got to their local environment. Uh, the need for a global um, approach is not neglected and they create an optimal learning environment for their kids. So <coughs> that was one thing that influenced me and this is another that I've taken a little bit of um, a change of heart. I originally quite liked the idea of Carol Dweck's positive education, but I think that it's been hijacked a bit, appropriated, and uh, changed into what it actually means, what she originally intended it to mean, at least. And the last two paragraphs here are from a school um, where I did some work. And you'll notice that at this school, we run, we run one extension class per core subject with the remaining classes being mixed ability. So if you look at their statement to begin with, they want to focus on building strengths, resilience and creating a sense of meaning and optimism and yet they still stream classes. And that decision as to who's in which class is made by someone who would not necessarily teach that kid. But clearly it's made on some sort of performance or something along those lines. And I find that a little bit distressing. That I, I find it hard to have, hold in my mind those two concepts of a positive education and yet we will decide where you are. It's next to me of losing agency if I'm a student. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm just coming at the other end of a bit of man flu, so... I'll remove the microphone before I cough. Um, the other people who have in, in influenced me have been uh, people such as Anne Kay and, and Seymour Papert, and you'll see them in a minute or so. And I'm also a great fan of science fiction, so you'll see a quote from uh, Robert Heinlein and well, as well. So Alan Kay often refers to the to this concept as playing air guitar, and I think we do a lot of that in school where kids don't actually do science. They learn about science or they learn scientific facts. They don't do mathematics. They learn about mathematical stuff, but they don't actually do it. So it's a little bit like uh, playing air guitar. Let's move on to one more. And I love this quote from Seymour Papert. And for those of you who haven't read Papert, I urge you to do so. Um, 
walk, uh, Ron did not walk straight to a library and pick up his book or grab it off Amazon, his books, I should say. And he is all about uh, here. You can see in this statement that it's a lot more about uh, immersion, I suppose, and a lot less about isolating uh, a learning program from its context. I love his last statement. If you want to do it in the United States, make a France. I think that's lovely. So I ask myself, you know, what I, what do we need? What, what should this modern generation have? And I came up with these statements. Um, I'm not too sure whether you agree with these or not. There will be a, um, a Google Doc that I'm going to pop up a little bit later on which you'll have access to and I'd be very interested in your thoughts um, after you've heard this or whilst this is going on. So we, I think we're split between three different um, people or three different groups of people. Business wants someone to be capable and increasingly someone who's a life learner and someone who can work with others and that is usually built into the capabilities of that person. Business, unfortunately, at the moment seems to be adopting this role of hard skills and soft skills and calls the hard skills things like mathematics and science and the soft skills things like empathy and uh, collaboration. That seems to be exactly out of phase to me. And I think the, the soft skills, the ones that are relatively simple, are the ones that we traditionally associate with disciplines and the hard ones are empathy and collaboration. But anyway, there you go. That's what business wants out of education. Society wants people to be empathetic, involved, and respectful. I think if you ask any uh, parent, uh, person on the street, what do you think education should do? I think those three would figure in all of that. And lastly, a personal requirement, which I don't think is looked at very often. Uh, it always strikes me as interesting that education is probably the only industry, if we can refer to it that way, that never actually asks or rarely asks for feedback from its clients. And its clients are increasingly um, students. Well, they always have been students. But it's lovely to get students to have some sort of agency and empowerment um, but we rarely allow them to make decisions, even in schools that have things such as a, a student uh, representative council or some such similar thing, are often given the responsibility of how they're going to raise money or who's going to organise the bake sale. There's nothing really gritty or um, of consequence that they often get to uh, decide and I think that's a pity. And from a personal perspective interviewing students and talking to these students, um, the, the personal I think is come, has come out of a lot of the students that I've taught. And I've added myself understand my world. And I'm currently involved as I mentioned earlier on on working with the digital technologies curriculum in Australia. Parts of that are STEM related and STEM and coding and all the rest of the stuff are all heralded as something that's going to save the world in terms of jobs. Um, seriously, we're not going to have even 10 or 15 percent of kids coming out becoming coders or engineers out of our schools, but we will have 100 percent coming out, I hope, that they will be able to understand their world. And in that respect, have some sort of agency over acting within that world. They won't be as easily fooled. Um, I think uh, Mark Twain once said that the sign of a good education is that you can tell when someone else is, t is talking rubbish. And I think that's important. So if we take those requirements and compare them to, first of all, the business world and look at what's happening over the past little while, we all talk about 21st century learning, which I'll talk about in a sec, then we've got this situation. And I think that situation is really, really powerful. If you look at the, the numbers there, they're, they're quite disturbing. If you run a company, S&P 500 is always 
supposedly being the best companies, the highest performing companies, they've now got 15 year lifestyle. I think that's quite interesting. The link to that, by the way, is the Singularity University, which I'm not too sure whether people have got um, uh, knowledge of that at su.edu. It started by Ray Kurzweil, who used to design musical instruments. He's a bit of a boy genius, or he's an old man genius now. But um, Singularity University is based on the idea that technology is going to give us, um, for the cost of $1,000, all the computing power of every human's brain in the world and that he estimates will happen around 2050 the exact date doesn't matter now he has a lot of critics in the world who say oh that's rubbish it's never going to happen blah 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 but the point is that he started to investigating what the implications of those are in terms of law in terms of society finance jobs how society hangs together ethics all of those things um, are being studied at that university and it's quite a worthwhile thing to keep in touch with. So one of the industries that I've looked at is uh, Valve and you're not too, you may not be aware of this uh, company but Valve are the people who make the engine called Steam that most of the world's computer games run on and they put out a, a handbook for employees if you google Valve handbook for employees you'll come up with this as a PDF document. It's getting on now, it's been there for a while, but I used to use this to talk to kids about um, what their world might be like and why um, that's important at some stage later. So they're after a thing called a T-shaped model, an employee who has a deep understanding in one area but a broad ranging generalist perspective in others. And I'm finding this with some of the work that I'm doing with the community in my new job in trying to understand how people are using digital technologies in a wide range of differing areas, that this is increasingly the case. That someone who might be a biologist, for argument's sake, is needed, needs to go out and understand electronics so that they can talk to someone about an instrument that they're using to measure some parameter that's important to them in their work. They have to have some basic understanding, otherwise we get into all sorts of strife. And in fact, um, 30 minutes ago I was at a seminar in my hometown in Armidale at the local university, 45 minutes ago I tell a lie, um, looking at the use of sensors to assist in the irrigation of plants for food, in food crops and um, one of the big problems with uh, that was that the people who are deploying them don't understand the nature of the sensor and under what circumstances it can supply incorrect data and you end up spending an enormous amount of money which is a bit disappointing so i encourage you to read through that and thanks very much to um <coughs> excuse me, to um, Peggy, I think it was, who put up the link to that um, bail thing. It's well worth a read and it's well worth giving to students. So recently, not long ago, a Harvard University group tried to answer the same question that I posed at the beginning. What does a good education look like? And they came up with these statements or these observations, I suppose. One is a wish. The second is an observation. And it's very pleasing to see that they agree with me. I like that. But you can read that on your own. The important thing is the nature of the disconnect between how education gets delivered in the classroom. And I struggle with that verb as well, delivered in the classroom. It's like ordering pizza. And if you think about it, everyone in schools gets the pizza base and the, uh, the tomato sauce and cheese and then decides what optional agreements they're going to have, but they're all basically getting pizza. And I think that's a, an unfortunate illusion using the term deluded. So let's just move on. This is the, um, the guy that... Uh, most of you will recognise Robert A. Heinlein, who's a science fiction author. 
and I like this, you should be able to change the diaper, plan an invasion, butcher a hog, corner ship, design a building, write a sonnet, balance accounts, build a wall, set a bone, comfort the dome, take orders, etc. Now what's really interesting is that if you look at a large number of teachers, you will find that they are one of the most capable people in the world. I had the pleasure of working with some fantastic teachers um, and who was most relevant in an outdoor education experience when we suddenly had to change one venue for a five day walk that our 16 year olds were doing on their own. Um, we had to find another venue because the original one had burnt down in a wildfire and was still too dangerous for students to go into. And the five teachers that I have working with me and myself were able to conjure up a radio network, satellite phone uh, depositions, walking treks, watering points, all of this with safety in two days. And the, the, the ability of those teachers to do that, it, it continually astounds me. And if you look through that list, you will see that there are a large number of things that either you or some of your close mates are able to do, especially pitch manure, I suppose, to the uh, third or fourth last one. And it's unfortunate that we don't give teachers the flexibility to be able to, to do what they're good at, think on their feet, manipulate things rather than sticking to some lesson plan that was written years ago that they're going to get inspected on and it's nasty. Anyway, it's a nice, a nice quote. So I think if we take all of that into consideration and then start to look at what is being used to inform the decision of what is a good education, we start to see some signs that are not really particularly accurate. Apologies to those in the United States. This is in kilometres per hour. Uh, it's not in miles per hour. So that's roughly 15 miles per hour that you're being requested to go through that curve. And that would be an excellent speed to go through because, of course, the curve doesn't obey the sign. So there you go. So let's have a look at some of the signs that we have been um, subjected to recently. Yong Zhao has done some really, really good work in looking at the PISA scores, and this is from his ZhaoLearning.com website, his blog, and it maps the PISA 2009 math scores with the perceived entrepreneurship capabilities on the left-hand side. So what this means is that, for argument's sake, the United States and the United Arab Emirates, and to a certain extent Greece, that tend to be very entrepreneurial, but they don't actually work particularly well in mathematics. And there seems to be an almost one-to-one -one correlation between the ability to excel at a mathematics test and the ability to be an entrepreneur. Which I thought was interesting. There's a lot of other work that he has done with that as well. Here's some more. And this is the, the ranking of how the PISA mathematics scores went and that perceived entrepreneurial uh, capability as a bar chart to really ram that home. There are some outriders there, but there seems to be a pretty good indicator. And interestingly enough, if you keep the red bars, the 2009 PISA mathematics, and change the blue line to the number of suicides in their student age group per thousand people, you have much the same spread. And I'd encourage you to chase that up on Zhao Learning as well. Sometimes these signs or these things, these statistics are things which look good because they use maps and all sorts of interesting things, but they don't actually mean anything necessarily. So this is a, a lovely thing um, that shows how data can be uh, displayed to give an impression that one thing is happening but not another. So clearly the number of people who drown by falling in a swimming pool is probably not related to the number of films that Nicolas Cage appeared in, although 
some of those films have been pretty terrible and you might feel like killing yourself afterwards. But nonetheless, a correlation does not necessarily mean that there is some sort of causality between the variables that you're measuring. So let's come back to Diane Ravitch and the, the Finnish um, bit of business on why the Finns are perceived to be doing so well in um, certain areas. Although they're being overtaken by uh, people in Asia at the moment, Yong Zhao reckons that's because of chopsticks. He thinks that chopsticks are the causal element in those countries in uh, moving ahead. So if we don't need to worry about external test scores and their possible effects on their work, curriculum planning can serve as a powerful means to collegial professional development within the school. What's best for the students rather than what's best for the testing? And I think that that's really interesting. So where's my cursor going? There it is. In Australia, our new um, technology, our new syllabus, or sorry, not syllabus, curriculum, our new curriculum nationwide, has a really interesting element in that it has a mathematics curriculum, an English curriculum, etc. But it also has a thing called general capabilities, and these are the sorts of things that should be taught in every single subject or every single subject area. I still have a problem with that subject business that was, I'll talk about in a minute. But ethical understanding, Australia's place in Asia, understanding the indigenous peoples of Australia, and ICT general capabilities are the four general capabilities which underlie our overall curriculum. Isn't that lovely to see ethics taking place in this, understanding ethical concepts? exploring values, rights, and responsibilities. And this, of course, is only a few statements on a page, but it's built out. And again, going to australiancurriculum.edu.au will give you some idea about how each of these things underpins uh, all of the different discipline areas that are taught within the school. <coughs> Excuse me. I found it interesting that if you type in school makes me feel that we get this And I think that that is a bit of an indictment about uh, what's actually happening um, within our schools. And when we think about it, we, we think that we're beyond that, um, that the days of old when we felt like that, those sorts of things have gone. But it's still a little bit sad, the kid, that these things come up as a frequently asked question, if you like, on Google. In France recently, I found, I happened upon this, which is a plaque outside a school. You can see the rough idea of the time period of this, uh, of when this was uh, taken, this, um, this photograph. Um, the little guy that we're about to hear from is circled up the top right. Um, there are a few characters in there whom I think you could look at and immediately say, well, he's going to be a challenge. Um, but nonetheless, let's move on and let's have a look. There was a, uh, a French say underneath this. That thankfully, my wife, who's literate in French, was able to translate for me. My mother presented me to the master of the class that I was about to enter. She kissed me and went down the staircase, which consumed her bit by bit. When her head had disappeared, I felt like the shipwrecked person who sees the ship that could have saved disappear over the horizon. I was alone in the middle of unknown boys, civilised by strict men and in a dark place where I was going to be submitted to atrocious obligations. Despair engulfed me. I was a very bad student. I didn't like the things they made me do. The most abominable was to write in an exercise book with a wooden fountain pen topped with a feather, with a sergeant major nib pointed like a lance which ruined the paper and spat jets of ink. My book was covered in stains. Me too. When you think of this, it starts to make you think that maybe that, even though it's, it's talking years and years and years ago, is perhaps not as oldie-worldie as we may originally have thought. 
So this um, is a movie which unfortunately didn't come across in the translation, but let me tell you the story behind it. This young fellow is in year nine at our school, in his ninth year of education in the school that I was teaching at, and he's just finished a science experiment. He's using his laptop camera to test whether or not a ball that is thrown by his um, colleague can be caught accurately if he covers one eye or if he covers the other eye or if he has both eyes open. Ask the teacher what class, what we, what we were doing in the class. And he said, oh, they were taking notes about uh, binocular vision in mammals and why it was important. And I said, you realize that this guy is probably the only bloke who was doing science in your class. Everyone else was just copying stuff down from the board. So th this business, as I referred to earlier on, as this disciplinary siloing of education automatically stops all those things that Heinlein was talking about, that Papert was talking about, that going back over and over and over again to all of these people, back as far as Piaget, back as far as Vygotsky, um, Paolo Freire, um, John Dewey, all of these people are talking about what way works as education and yet we continue with what we're doing. But we're supposed to be looking at what makes good education, so let's move on. This is a lovely cartoon which reminds me of the idiocy of some of the things that we use to teach. I think um, Peanuts is marvellous. So what else have we got? If you went to this school, you would be forgiven for thinking that every other room in the school doesn't have any innovation going on in it. And I think this is a little bit uh, reminiscent of this thing that we've got involving us at the moment called STEM education. And whilst I consider the integration of the science, technology, engineering and maths, as a good thing, people are already starting to add A's and R's and things to it to make it into STEAM or STREAM or whatever. So there's a genuine wish there, I think, from teachers to allow us to teach kids, not teach subjects. But it's become a little bit of a distraction, I think, when we go through some of the latest bits of business in um, in what is acclaimed to be the new directions in education. Again, we're not necessarily asking kids or giving kids the opportunity to express what's going on in their own mind. I'm not too sure how many of you have played with Star Logo Nova, but there's a story behind this of the computer school in um, New York in Manhattan on the Upper West Side and the Middle West Side of uh, Manhattan and in 2015 I took a group of uh, teachers from Australia on a tour uh, to look at education in different areas and we met up with a lady called Tracy Ritsidis who was employed by the computer school and was told by the principal to just let the kids play games in her computer studies class. So she did. And this game is uh, a game where you use a star logo Nova to explore complex adaptive systems. <coughs> so I sat alongside a year six kid, upper primary um, or upper elementary, I suppose, um, who was investigating how disease spread through uh, a, a population. It was a game to him, but she very cunningly um, used the principal's words to allow that kid to do stuff. This is a year five kid, year six kid, I'm sorry. And in talking to a number of scientists, they just couldn't get over the fact that a kid of that age was able to do stuff. And this is what I said, IT will do for you. This is a bunch of kids that I had a few years back where we did a combined unit of work on medieval history, mathematics, science, English language, and something else. Oh yeah, technology. Now these kids had down as their plan was to make a TV tray in technology where all the bits were, they had to cut out all the bits, they were all the same bits, so your handle looked like my handle. You glued everything together and then you did some paperwork on it. 
and I was at that stage head of that particular uh, unit of work in uh, sorry that discipline within the school. So I said, no, we're not teaching this anymore. We're going to do something a little bit more relevant. Luckily, I was working in a situation where we could combine all of those subjects. So these boys, who are 13, 12 and 13 years old, are in the process of building a siege machine to break down a castle. Fantastic. If you're a 12 or 13 year old boy, this is an all boys school, then building something that breaks things is fantastic. They came in all different shapes and models. And they basically weren't taught any woodworking skills before this. The local woodwork teacher was pulling his hair out because he said they'll all fall apart because they don't know how to make a miter joint. And I said, good. That means that they'll have a need to learn a miter joint. And on and on they went. Eventually, learning how to construct these quite complex devices. And if you've never had a year, a 12-year-old boy come up and tug your sleeve and say, can you teach me a thing called Pythagoras? Because that will allow me to make a stronger machine and I'll be able to throw further than my mate. It's a wonderful feeling. We did some amazing mathematics in this. And again, this is with a year, uh, a 12-year-old boy. This is his blog page. <coughs> Excuse me. This is quite a while ago, as you'll see. It's 10 years ago. Um, where I asked them, what's the optimum, do you know what the optimal angle is for launching your um, missile to break the castle wall? And they said, yeah, it's 45 degrees. We looked it up. And I said, well, is yours 45 degrees? And they said, well, I think so. I said, well, how do you know? And I said, well, I don't know. So well, how could we work that out? So we ended up using the cameras in their um, laptops, filming the uh, launch. And then, as you'll see there, captured two frames, one just before release and one after, pasted one frame over the other, lowered the opacity of the top frame, drew a circle, drew a line tangent to the circle, worked out the angle, and saw that it was actually 30 degrees, not 45. So we ended up building a lot better um, trebuchet. Now this is, I suppose, back to the Heinlein quote, these are kids doing all sorts of stuff which you wouldn't expect them to be able to do. So what I'd like you to do is to have a brief look at uh, this YouTube video. And in here, we've got a year four boy. Excuse me, I'll just pause. Just pause that for a second. This year four boy is using Scratch. And basically what I did was to walk into this class, uh, Sagata Mitra style, and say, this is how Scratch works. You've got a stage, you've got actors. Actors can have different costumes. They can also have different sounds. And this is how you tell the actors what to do. I'll come back in 10 days and see what you've got. This is what he's got. Okay, so I'll just stop it there for a sec. And you may have missed that word. The word was variable. So just listen to what he says next. So you can change it, and then it can be that you tell you the score. But 
It doesn't have to be a scoreboard. You type in what you want to name it. Like it could be anything. Yep. So it works, it works vice versa for each team. How do you work that out? How do you know what to do? Um, I've just been reading. <laughs> yeah, I must be telling you a few things, but I've also been reading scripts, changing things, putting things on and off. Is other people's scripts? Yeah, I mean, look, I, uh, uh, Marcus told me about how to, about, Cameron told me about the scoreboard. No, you did. But Marcus told me about the scoreboard, and I just told been, me. Yeah, and then Marcus told me. But I've been changing things and been doing with it. But how do you know when it's working really well? Uh, I don't know. When are you going to finish it? Sorry, just to ask you a silly question. When are you going to be happy with it? When are you going to finish it? Or when do you know that you've finished it? Um, when, uh, when I've worked out and stopped, when I've just made sure everything's working properly, because at the moment it's been glitched a bit. Right, so I'm going to pull it up there. Um, the the URL to that is in the um, in the chat box, and uh, forgive me if I haven't been paying attention to the chat box as much as I should have. Perhaps I detach that panel and make it big on another screen. I don't even know if you can do that. No, it doesn't allow you to do that. Okay, fantastic. Um, I can detach it, but I can't put it on a separate screen. Thing, so that's uh, a little bit annoying, but still, there you go. Okay, so um, I want to put a link into um, into your uh, gizmo now, where, and I'll put this into the chat box, the chat list, and this is a collaborative document which is I just call rich tasks. And in that, I've got a bunch of uh, ideas that can be, I've, I've sort of started it and said, okay, well, what sort of things might we be able to do which are rich tasks uh, that fit within these disciplines and possibly cross-disciplinary? And the things that um, I've got in here are just a starter. The only thing that you might need to understand is stage four or five. Australian um, education goes by stages, so it goes stage uh, one is kindergarten through to two, stage two is three, four, stage three is uh, five, six. So basically, if you want to look at the 12th year of education or the 11th year, you divide it by two and that's stage six. So any reference that's in there uh, can work that out. So this is a document which I'm working on at the moment. It's only got a few things in there, and if people would like to toss in their ideas, I'd uh, really appreciate it. And I've now been talking for about 40 minutes, so I don't want to talk much anymore except answer questions. So um, are you there, Lucy? I am. It's such a but I'm okay. here. Yes, I am. Um, All right, okay. cool. So how do we want to, um, what's the best way in your opinion to manage um, questions or comments? If everybody, I think, I think we're a small and intimate group that if we give everybody the, the everybody does have the microphone privileges right now. So if anybody yeah. wants to grab the mic and say something um, and ask you a question, I, they're more than welcome to. Maybe we have somebody raise the hand, their hand first and then we'll call on them. Um, Bahavna, did you want to ask something? I saw that you have the mic on. Stephanie, would you like to ask a question? I see you have your mic on too. Anybody want to ha ask a question or share a comment about things? Um, I'll, I'll start with something, Martin. Um, I'm giddy with lack of sleep right now, so I'm not the sharpest right now. But what I'm what I'm thinking about, are you typical of most Australians in terms of thinking deeply about education topics? I mean, is this, do you find that your fellow educators in your country have the time and the resources and 
encouragement to engage deeply with their practice? Um, no, and I think this, this is a problem worldwide. Um, the various countries give, give teachers more uh, options and the, you know, the one that everyone points at is the Finnish um, business where teachers are given a lot of time to reflect on what they do. We always talk to students about the importance of reflection as a learning uh, tool and, and we don't practice it ourselves. Um, I guess having been, um, well there are two things that have encouraged me to um, reflect on my own thinking and this is common with a lot of the people that I associate with, yourself included Lucy, and that is that if you're going to present anything to anyone then you really should have some idea about what you're talking about which means that you need to reflect on what you've done and make sure that what's there truly truly uh, represents what it is that uh, you're on about and hopefully I've done that. Um, but the second thing is even from an industry perspective any industry that's worth its while and is going to last will always do product development and we rarely get the opportunity as teachers to do product development. Uh, increasingly we get handed a curriculum or a syllabus from someone whom we've never met that says um, you're going to do this now and everyone spends all their time running around trying to change to doing the new this um, and I think that that's unfortunate. The idea of product development or um, prototyping as um, uh, Taz Teach Sue just put in, uh, sorry, as Lucy just put in, um, and Peggy again, if you're following a script you don't have to think. That's very true, but gee whiz, it's so much more exciting and interesting if you go off script occasionally. Let's look at your esteemed president and look at the excitement that happens when he goes off script. So, but seriously, if, if you're in, um, if you're in uh, the teaching game and you never get an opportunity to sit down and think about what worked and what didn't work and how you might vary things to suit the kid or the kids um, that's, um, uh, that are in your care, and I, I, everyone gets bored including the kids. So I don't know whether that answers your question, uh, Lucy, but I hope it does. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. I mean, I think there's some countries out there where they're, they're, they're struggling to find basic education, um, to have basic education needs met, you know, in terms of high quality teachers and um, so on and so forth. I mean, that's a whole other animal. And then in more developed countries, I mean, I've always found a sense that, that Australia and New Zealand in, in general were a little bit better schooled than we were in terms of inquiry kinds of, you know, education. Um, certainly New Zealand is known for their literacy work. Um, you know, I just, it just seems to me that we here, we've, we've, we've been very piecemeal and I think it, it really depends here because, because we're a large country, I think. Um, where you go and, and is how thoughtful schools can be. I, I generally find in my work that a lot of independent schools in the U.S. are really thoughtful schools and it kind of makes me, and I'm a product of an independent school and I taught one for a long time and I, and I really value what they do but that increasingly is becoming more apparent to me that it's for a certain population of kids whether we like it or not. It's, it's just the way it is. It's not necessarily intentional, but it is the way it is. And, and so here in the U.S. we expect, you know, the elite to be educated one way and then the not so elite to be worked more in school. And I find, I think that's what has bothered me the most. I mean, I'm going off on a tangent here, but what's bothered me is that we have varying expectations and about what's high quality for different populations, as opposed to thinking like, well, maybe certain kids need to be engaged more. We don't, here in the U.S., we don't talk about student engagement. And, you know, and as a parent of two teenagers, I honestly don't think the curriculum matters that much. Yes, they need some basic stuff, but they need to be passionate and find their path. And 
there in their public school years, there's been very little. They, speaking of autonomy, they haven't had a lot of autonomy. So that's a lot in what I'm babbling about. But um, that's what I see as the crux of the problem in the U.S. I'd love to hear anyone else's opinion, um, particularly someone. There was one person on from New Zealand. New Zealand is doing some amazing stuff um, in uh, the curricular space. So I'd be interested in hearing that from, I'm not, didn't, wasn't too sure who it was, but there was someone from New Zealand on at one stage. Um, are you there, New Zealand? Come in, New Zealand. Um, yeah. I did meet somebody at a conference in the Middle East um, a number of years ago who worked at a college of education in um, New Zealand. And what I loved about his approach, this is another can of worms, uh, he had kind of a coaching model for, uh, for teachers in their professional life. There was a very specific protocol, you know, um, that helped teachers become more professional and grow in general. And his name was Kevin Knight. He was really, um, I was really impressed by his work. And, you know, I, I think that's another thing, too. Like, do we treat teachers as if they're broken and need to be fixed? Or do we treat teachers as professionals that need guidance and support and um, coaching? So that's my New Zealand comment. Um, Peggy just said, you've given us a lot to think about, Martin. Thank you so much for a great presentation. Um, so, yes, thank you, Martin. Do you want to do you want to close with some final thoughts and then we'll stop recording? And um, I yeah, know sure. I, I wish um, Steve was here. The, uh, I wish Steve was here because he would love he would love to debate you on all this. <laughs> I'd love to debate him. Okay, so there's there's the the next thing that we need to do together. Let's see, is organise that debate. Um, look, I've put down into the chat window there a um, uh, a website um, which is the um, the new uh, Australian Institute for Teaching and School Leadership, shortened to AITSL, and in there you will see the teacher standards that are rapidly becoming uh, promulgated throughout Australia. Unlike the USTI standards, these are uh, mandatory if you want to continue to teach then you need to adhere to these standards. The standards are not uh, fixed. You don't do them once and then that's it. Um, they are in a, um, a hierarchy if you want um, and you move from a, a teacher who is competent to a teacher who is proficient to a teacher who has leadership uh, aspirations or leadership um, who works as a leader or wants to work as a leader. And irrespective of what level you're in, you have to have accomplished a certain number of hours uh, of professional learning uh, over a certain period of time, slightly different in each state, to uh, enable you to continue your teacher registration, which I think is rather beaut. Um, I know that in the US a lot of people move towards a master's um, uh, level and people such as one of the sponsors, uh, Digital Promise, the sponsors of this Global EdCon uh, are working on micro-credentials like badging that can go up to others. Um, that is, um, that I think is a move in the right direction as long as it doesn't become over-bureaucratised and silly. Um, but it's worth having a look at hl.edu.au and you'll see some stuff in there which is um, maybe informative as a way of comparing them to your mandatory requirements. So look, thank you for the intent, for the attention and uh, the, the the listening that you did to my wobbling on uh, in the afternoon. Um, it, the lovely opportunity was preparing this and thinking through what really moved me about a good education, and hopefully that will have some meaning to you. So thank you for the opportunity, Lucy, and thank you everyone for being here. Thank you. Next year we'll have you and Steve uh, say do two, do part two. Okay, we'll do curriculum at 20 paces. Okay.